Good morning and welcome to Business Morning. I'm Ladi Williams. And I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. Thank you for joining us. The International Monetary Fund says Nigeria's economy is currently at a critical currently critical as it faces higher inflation, falling external reserves, capital inflow, the COVID-19 pandemic, among others, um, challenges. In its latest report, which follows the conclusion of its consultation with government authorities on January 27th, the IMF emphasized the need for urgent policy adjustment and more fundamental reforms in order to sustain macroeconomic stability and drive growth and employment. These include increasing the value-added tax rate to at least um, 10% by 2022 and 15% by 2025, and a further devaluation of the Naira to ease external imbalances. Just last year, Nigeria raised its VAT rate from 5 to 7.5%, despite widespread public outcry. Meanwhile, the federal government has rejected the IMF's latest call for a further devaluation of the Naira. And our Unity Bank uh, PLC presented checks worth 4 million Naira to core members who have emerged winners of the Corepreneur uh, Challenge. A total of 12 members of the core received the business grant at the end of the competition uh, held in Abuja, Lagos, Ogun State and Edo. According to Unity Bank PLC, the grant is aimed at empowering core members in their chosen business. You take a listen. It's another opportunity for members of the National Youth Service Corps to compete for the Unity Bank PLC Corpreneurship Challenge, aimed at empowering young entrepreneurs. One after the other, those who scale through the preliminary stages take turns to present their business pitch before the panel of judges for scrutiny. The competing core members are evaluated on the basis of originality, presentation, financial knowledge, business, marketability, and futuristic employment generation proposition. After thorough evaluation, winners emerge in the four locations where the competition has been held, namely Abuja, Benin, Lagos, and Ogun. The first runners-up receive 300,000 Naira each, while the first positions are presented checks of 500,000 Naira each. According to Unity Bank PLC, in addition to the monetary benefits, the winners will be onboarded into the banking system, where they will also be mentored. Uh, once they are onboarded into the bank system, um, uh, the team that handles um, businesses along their sectorial locations goes into their businesses, appraise their businesses, look at their location, look at their markets, and look at logistics around it and see how we can assist in ensuring that they scale up. Elated, the beneficiaries hope to make judicious use of the grants they received, just as NYC officials commend Unity Bank for the gesture. In the course of this sum of money, I will be able to start and to enhance my own business here in Edo, having have one at Ekiti State. Currently, I realize that Nigeria spent over 135 billion naira in Nigeria just to import fish. So for me, I feel like that, that is a gap that I personally have decided that I want to take this initiative to hold the hands of my fellow Nigerians to be able to ensure that we're able to meet the demands in the area of fish agriculture. We are so happy and elated and we are encouraged the core members are encouraged, and you'll see more of core members showing interest in learning skills. So I feel elated, I'm happy. The Corpreneurship Challenge, according to Unity Bank PLC, will be sustained and hopefully continue to contribute to reduction in the number of unemployed youth in Nigeria. And one of Africa's largest conglomerates, Boer Group, has paid for one million doses of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines for Nigeria through the Afrixim vaccine program in partnership with CACOVID. In a statement released yesterday, the company says the vaccines will be distributed to Nigerians at no cost. Boer's founder, Abdul Samad uh, Rabiu says he expects the vaccine to be delivered within the next 14 days and with priority expected to be given to frontline workers who have committed their lives to managing the pandemic. According to him, the doses of the vaccine will be the first delivery of vaccines to Nigeria since the COVID-19 vaccines became available. He adds that the conglomerate is committing to purchasing 5 million doses for Nigeria as soon as they become available through the same arrangement. Mm -hmm.
And uh, Chimmy, I'm wondering which one are you going to take? Is it the AstraZeneca or BioNTech? What's well, whichever your, one that proves to be efficient, whichever one that proves to be efficient, okay. I, I guess I'll go for that. But I'm open to taking the vaccine. There's nothing okay. wrong in taking the vaccine if All it right. comes and proves efficient. Remember, the AstraZeneca, uh, um, I mean, has a problem. In yeah, South Africa, variant, yes, yes, the South African variant exactly. there, and they had to put a stop to it. But in any case, we'll look at the efficacy of whichever one that counts. Exactly. Uh, meanwhile, oil prices edged up to their highest in 13 months. Uh, supply cuts uh, by major producers and optimism uh, over fuel demand recovery support energy markets. Brand crude futures uh, for April gained uh, 29 cents to $60.85 a barrel. Uh, U.S. West Texas intermediate crude for March was at $58.25 a barrel, uh, up 28 cents. Uh, both Brent and WTI are at their highest since January uh, 2020. Front month of prices for both contracts are up for the seventh session on Tuesday, the longest win a streak since January 2019. Additional supply uh, reductions by top exporter Saudi Arabia in February and March on top of cuts by producers in organization of the uh, petroleum exporting countries and their allies are uh, tightening supplies and balancing uh, global markets. Investors are also pinning hopes on oil demand uh, recovery when COVID-19 vaccines take effect. A weak dollar has also helped uh, shore up uh, prices of commodities. Mm. And as um, oil prices go up, yeah. what's the implications of this for Nigeria? These and more on Commodities Market Update next. It's business Nerve Center and Uh, Dumebi Iyeke, one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives, joins us now for the Commodities Market Update. Dumebi, happy to see you again. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you again. All right, well, the IMF has just released its um, Article 4 consultation and, of course, um, have made some comment about Nigeria's um, recovery, which it says would actually be very gradual, but mm -hmm. made some point, mm -hmm. raised the issue of um, devaluation mm -hmm. of the Naira, even though the federal government says, no, we're not going to do, mm -hmm. do that. Now, we have seen oil prices, again, going up, as I said, this morning. Sixty-one yeah. um, dollars per barrel above the pre-pandemic um, era. Do you see any hope there? Therefore, um, starting with uh, the IMF's opinion on uh, global economic recovery and the domestic economic recovery, we're seeing that they're quite optimistic, um, and this is because of the vaccine rollouts and the expectation that. Um, several economies would recover gradually, even though it's going to be slow. Um, the expectation for the global economy is that um, Asia would recover at a faster pace than any other um, economy. So now bringing this to Nigeria, they've always been of the opinion that a market-determined exchange rate um, regime is very good for investors. Why? Because they can, um, at an, at, to an extent, determine where the Naira is going or where, the, where that country's currency is going. And that helps them make... Um, investment decisions. So um, with the multiple exchange rate regime that we have currently running in Nigeria, that's where, that's where they're advocating for um, possible devaluation to bring the IEFX rates and the official rates closer. And generally, um, several analysts are still um, of the opinion that that process, that convergence process will continue. Um, even though uh, the EIU estimates that the official rate of the Naira could be devalued again in 2021 um, to about 450 Naira um, to a dollar. So we're just going to keep our fingers crossed to see if um, this is going to play out right now. And oil prices, definitely, um, this is a huge sign of recovery for both the global economy and a very good news for Nigeria in terms mm. of government revenue and um, the government meeting up with its uh, budget obligations. I mean, um, the 2021 budget benchmark for oil is $40 per barrel. Now this is over 50%, you know, of, so meaning that there is some revenue coming in. So this means an increase in um, foreign inflows, um, foreign, foreign currency inflows. It also means um, a an increase in the capacity of the government to meet its budget obligations and possibly, you know, show up the narrow, keep the narrow stable for some time. Mm. Anyway, but uh, with this uh, current uh, oil price, uh, where does this leave the average Nigerian considering this uh, deregulation dilemma? I mean, uh, like you said, deregulation dilemma. Yeah. Um, we still saw on the news that um, the federal government and you know the unions are still deliberating on whether to increase or not to increase the PMS mm. price again. Yeah. And once there is a deregulation, 
of any commodity, just like um, PM, just like um, the, the price of diesel, it goes with the market. As once oil prices are going up, we should see an increase in the price of PMS. And um, generally, people are it's, it's it's going to take a toll on consumer disposable income, considering the fact that the Nigerian consumer is already battered enough. We have higher energy costs, higher transport costs, and now a possible increase again in the price of PMS. Um, there are estimates that it could increase again to about 180 naira to 190 naira um, per liter. So, and there is still inflation. Mm -hmm. Consumers, their income is not increasing. So you have a job now, but your income hasn't increased. So you're still living in the nominal, the nominal value is still there, but the real value of your income has literally, you know, been eroded by inflation. So definitely it puts the Nigerian, the average Nigerian, in a very um, difficult situation because now you're going to be battling with um, a possible increase in food prices because of insecurity. You're looking at an increase in PMS price. So this is logistics costs and energy costs yeah. as well. Okay, now let's look at another um, headliner there. Um, we have the candy producer, um, Hershey, yeah. uh, reporting uh, their fourth quarter financials. And um, surprisingly, the company recorded a 41% um, um, increase. That's despite the resurgence mm -hmm. of um, COVID uh, cases in Europe and US. Now, what do you think this will mean for uh, global prices of um, cocoa and, um, of course, you know, Nigeria would deal cocoa as well, one of our um, ex, uh, agri exports. Um, first of looking at her, she is a very top um, global candy producer and chocolate here. So with uh, seeing whatever thing happens with them, we could use that as a proxy for what could you know, possibly happen with other um, chocolate producers or candy producers and how this would affect the global market for um, cocoa. And in turn, Nigeria, who is... Um, a very large um, producer of um, cocoa, and cocoa accounts for cocoa is like the, cocoa is the second, you know, um, top agricultural export commodity for Nigeria after sesame seeds. So um, generally, they had an increase in the profit due to the fact that. Consumers, for, apparently consumers found a very innovative way to keep their holiday um, season going, and this was very reflective in um, uh, um, in Hershey's. Um, um, Q420 financial report, and they also um, recorded an increase in demand from North America. From, so definitely, with this happening with, with um, Hershey, we could see a, a possible increase in the demand for cocoa, because now there is some respite in terms of um, the demand for um, chocolate-based products and candies. So and, uh, gener and uh, 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 Hershey actually makes use of cocoa butter more than cocoa beans. So, and um, they the um, demand for that more from Ivory Coast and Ghana. So definitely for Nigeria, this is a huge sign that we need to do more in terms of cocoa butter production and um, also in terms of our um, cocoa beans as well. But definitely um, we'll def we would see this play out in the global price of um, cocoa, which has been increasing, um, fortunately, for Nigeria. So if there's an increase in the global price of cocoa, this means more exports revenue for Nigeria. So, uh, But we just have to... Um, Look, def look uh, in depthly into the how this chain. exactly into mm. the value chain, and apart from that, we look at what these companies need. And mm. Hershey was very explicit in their report saying that they make use of cocoa butter more. Mm. So this is a huge sign for anybody who is producing, um, be it Ivory Coast, be it Ghana, and now Nigeria. We have to look more into the production of cocoa butter since most um, um, chocolatiers would make use of that more. So mm. it's just a huge sign that cocoa butter, yes, cocoa beans, yes, but we mm. definitely have to do more but in the value chain of that commodity. Like, uh, chocolate production. Mm -hmm. Is, are there any signs of Nigerian producers actually, you know, producing chocolates? Um, I mean, in, in Nigeria, um, we, could, we, could see, we could see that happen, especially with this happening now that even though there is a pandemic, we're still seeing an increase in the demand for yeah. um, sweets, for candy. So um, we, we, we could right. definitely right. see people play out. Market. And I actually saw a Nigerian-made chocolate. So exactly, I was like, exactly. And, and now with this happening, you know, this is definitely going to create an open space for people to venture into the um, industry. And we could, we could see a lot of more companies, you know, springing Spring up in that, regard, in that regard, rather. Okay, let's look at um, the domestic commodities price movements mm -hmm. there. Uh, we can see uh, from your slide there the price of tomato down to 6500 per basket. Do you think this trend will continue and uh, probably uh, will spill over to other widely consumed um, commodities? 
Um, for now, the price of tomato is down because it's just um, pure seasonality playing out. Um, as the year goes by, when, once the planting season commences for tomato, we could see the price increase, which is very typical every year. Um, the, sp the same thing would play out in several commodities because these are Greek commodities. So once the planting season commences, prices would go up. Once the harvest season commences, prices um, would go down. So we just this is just seasonality taking its effect. But um, the most important thing is... Um, the factors affecting food production in Nigeria, and this is in terms of um, supply chain disruptions, insecurity in the food belt. You know, all of these factors need to be addressed so that we, we have ample supply of this commodity. So regardless of whether there is um, the planting season or the harvest season, there is enough to go around. And I see the uh, price of wheat is up. What does yeah. that mean for the uh, domestic commodity market for wheat? Um, a lot, of, a lot of companies that produce um, flour yeah. that we use for bread, you know, um, they import wheat. So once the price of wheat goes up, this simply means an increase in their import cost. And yeah. this would, you know, factor into their cost of production for flour and possibly factor into the um, price of of bread, yeah. but a lot of times because of um, the kind of commodity that bread is, it's an inelastic, it's an inelastic um, com price, an elastic commodity. So rather than change, rather than increase the price of the commodity, we could see miniaturization take place. So what, what does that mean? Producers of bread would rather create the illusion that your bread is still the same quantity, mm -hmm. rather than reduce or rather than increase yeah. the price. So they just create that illusion that yeah. oh, it's still the same price, your bread is still the same quantity. You know, but they, they help <laughs> they help reduce. <laughs> it's yes. okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dumebi, for that update. And we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, the latest decision by the central bank on cryptocurrency trading remains a major topic of discussion, particularly as the market continues to gain momentum globally. On Monday, Tesla CEO Elon Musk announced it has bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. In a filing with Securities and Exchange Commission, Tesla also said it will start accepting payments in Bitcoin in exchange for its product, subject to applicable laws and initially on a limited basis. Now, this took Bitcoin to about $47,000 as of this morning. What would this recent directive by the CBN on cryptocurrency mean for investment into the country? We'll be talking to the editor-in-chief, Stairs Business, Tokumbo Afikoyomi, next. Well, the level of investments and especially FDIs coming into the country has been consistently falling in the last few quarters. A critical part of Nigeria's growth plan depends on an investment-led strategy. In other words, Nigeria needs increased domestic and international investment. Many will think that these new rules coming from the central bank uh, about cryptocurrency trading might not be good for investor confidence, both existing and potential. Well, Tokumbo Afikuyomi, the editor-in-chief at Stairs Business uh, joins us now. Good morning, Tokumba. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So one of the cardinal features of money is its use as a store of value. If any currency of species loses that quality, confidence in the currency begins to erode. I'm saying this because some analysts have suggested that the adoption of cryptocurrencies as an alternative to the Naira is because of the galloping inflation in Nigeria, now at about 16%. Do you think that this link exists? And um, if so, what should policymakers yes. do in the short and long run to really position Nigeria in the new global financial system? That's a very good question. So if you look at the countries that have adopted cryptocurrencies, you see a pattern. There's very much a link between the countries that are adopting it quickly and the issues that those countries have with their official fiat currencies. And for that, and by fiat, I mean an official currency that is printed by a central bank. So in Nigeria, we have the Naira, which sees a lot of depreciation over time with inflation at, at as high as 16%, like you mentioned. But the other side to it as well is the exchange rate. So the exchange rate depreciation that we've seen, especially with the dollar that we've seen over the years, has made business very difficult for anyone that is doing any cross-border um, importing or ex exporting. And so they've looked to cryptocurrencies to try and circumvent some of the issues that they are finding, whether it's CBN restrictions or how much money you can spend 
how much money you can move between Nigeria and the rest of other borders. Um, cryptocurrencies have been used as a, as, a, as a way around some of those problems. And so the reason why cryptocurrency is actually so popular in Nigeria is because the Naira has been um, suffering many depreciations in both exchange rates and inflation. Mm. But uh, looking at the way uh, cryptocurrency prices fluctuate, like Bitcoin was at $39,000 just a few days ago. Today, uh, for about $47,000. How is it a better option to fire to fiat? Sorry. Well, it depends on the many different types of cryptocurrencies, um, of which of which Bitcoin is just one of them. We also have um, the cryptocurrency space also has uh, coins called stable coins. So stable coins do not have that volatility problem. Um, they remain fixed to a, to a particular exchange rate. And the dollar, it's USDC, which is basically a stable coin that is one, one, one to one with the dollar. And I've also seen reports of, of, of an NGNT as well, so a, a stable Naira um, digital currency. The thing to note about cryptocurrency is at the end of the day, these are just digital currencies. So just like you have the Naira, um, it is basically a currency that is digital that does not involve any note or coin. And while Bitcoin is just one of those cryptocurrencies, there are about 2,000 others of these coins that have different use cases. So if, you, if the use case you are looking for is stability, I agree with the point you are making that Bitcoin doesn't look like the, like the best thing. But there are other coins that are built specifically for um, stability concerns. Now, the Moody's report recently shows that about 38% of banking credits in Nigeria is in foreign currency. It was also believed that approximately 25% of deposit liabilities in Nigerian banks are in domiciliary accounts. Now, do you believe that the current negative real return on investment in Nigeria is responsible for this elegant form of capital flight? Yes, I mean, of course, we've seen, especially since the pandemic hit, we've seen a massive decrease in um, the interest rates that you can earn, especially on fixed income um, securities in Nigeria, um, whether it's OMO bills or government treasury bills. And so we've seen a massive decrease in those interest rates. And as you said, the real interest rates, which is the difference between inflation and any interest you earn on any security. So if you have inflation of 16%, if you're earning a security or any instrument that gives you 16%, then in real terms, that's 0%. So mm. Nigeria is in a place where because of that very high inflation rate, it's very difficult to find any instrument that you can use to save money or even just store and keep the value of your wealth over time. Um, with inflation at, at 16%, in, in, in 10 years, you're looking at losing almost you know, half of your money there. So it's, it's very important that people find these alternatives. And as we were talking about cryptocurrency in, in recent times, that has been one of the reasons why... Um, it's been quickly adopted as well. But there's definitely a link between that and, and, and the current um, fall we're seeing in real, real interest rates. All right. So um, Nigeria is attempting to uh, fully embrace mobile banking and a more efficient uh, payment system. The goal of increased uh, financial inclusion and a more efficient velocity of circulation of money is a function of a seamless uh, payment uh, system. Do these uh, restrictions in the use of alternative payment uh, system like cryptocurrencies, is it consistent with this goal? So as you mentioned, uh, financial inclusion is a big problem uh, for Nigeria. Mm -hmm. When we think of financial inclusion, a lot of times people are thinking more of just the uh, normal banking services. So can I withdraw and can I um, put money, for example? But even wider than that, there's a more nuanced problem where mm. when you start to look at other financial instruments like can I save, can I loan, um, can I get insurance, that's the part of financial inclusion that is a, at a very, very, very um, low rate in Nigeria, looking at 1%, 2% of, 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 the, of the economy that is able to get you know, loans and, 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 and insurance at, at affordable rates. And so financial inclusion, as we think of it, we have to make sure that we're not just thinking of the broad um, categories, but also the, the lower forms as well. Now, with cryptocurrency, there is, um, because of its nature in, in terms of it being digital and mobile mm. money, that, that there, is, there is room for that space to grow in terms of 
his ability to, to um, improve financial inclusion in Nigeria. It doesn't need banks. So it doesn't need, I don't need to have a, you know, a certain commercial bank in a particular location for, to be able to send you know, a cryptocurrency or, or Bitcoin to any individual in, in, in um that that makes Part that basically makes you right. your so, own bank, right? That makes you your own bank, exactly. and, and that's kind of the whole point of these cryptocurrencies to remove that middle man. Mm. Exactly, you become you become your own bank essentially. You don't need any of the of the financial institutions to include you into the system for you to be able to to benefit from the financial. Um, benefits of being part of the system. And so this is by on cryptocurrency from CBN is kind of going against that. Um, I guess on their side, they have, many, they have a, a number of reasons why they've done it. But I guess what the community is looking for is more engagement in terms of how can we go about regulating these cryptocurrencies as opposed to an all right ban just come very suddenly. Sure. So talking about um, regulation now, it is said that the lead capital market regulator in Nigeria is the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, cryptocurrencies are believed to be primarily investment before being considered as a medium of exchange. Therefore, the regulation, prohibition or restriction of financial instruments of this nature should be under the purview of SEC and not necessarily the central bank. Now, last year, SEC came out with plans and guidelines to regulate this market. And here is, a, again, is CBM coming up with a prohibition. Are these two regulators not contradicting themselves? What do you think now policymakers should do to harmonize these discordant positions and guidelines um, in, in order to position Nigeria well in this um, global way of doing uh, business? Yeah, you make a very good point there. And it's, 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 kind, it's, it's kind of bad because Nigeria is actually being seen as a leader in this space, especially in Africa, because of how quickly we have adopted cryptocurrency. Now, what the SEC announced back in September was a formal adoption of crypto assets, security. So they were looking and drafting laws to then label these crypto as a formal security in Nigeria. Now, what the CBN has now come out to do, as you mentioned, is almost a direct contradiction to that. They are now saying that we are not going to allow um, these cryptocurrencies to be exchanged on any formal um, crypto exchange. Now, what that does is take the formalization that the SEC was, was starting to do, if you, lots of backwards, because now what these cryptocurrency traders are going to do is go into the informal or black market world, where instead of trading on formal exchanges, which the SEC and the CBN can regulate, they will now do their transactions on informal platforms like WhatsApp or Telegram, where there's more proneness to fraud and more um, space to even conduct these you know, terrorism and, and, and money laundering activities in those informal spaces. So the CBN is, as you mentioned, contradicting what the SEC has tried to do in terms of formalizing the space. And what the leaders need to do is come together to, 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 to speak on that one voice because I know this is a cryptocurrency issue, but because of these contradictions between policies, it's actually a negative effect on both domestic and foreign investors across the whole of Nigeria. It's not just a cryptocurrency problem, it's a public policy and policy announcement problem. These, these contradictions and sudden um, announcements have a detrimental effect on the business environment. If you, con if you connect with you know, what we saw in Lagos State with the Okada ban, where the ban itself was not the problem, but the which it was done and conducted was detrimental to the business community. And so that's kind of the wider issue that we have here. So uh, looking at uh, digital currencies, uh, it's, it looks like the central banks basically have no control uh, over it and they see it as a threat. Uh, what for you should be the best approach uh, to these uh, for the regulators? Yes, you make a very um, good point there. This issue with cryptocurrencies is not a Nigerian one. It's a global problem that all central banks are trying to wrap their heads around. By default or by definition, these cryptocurrencies are decentralized. And they, as, I, as I mentioned before, they don't need banks and they certainly they don't need central banks. These currencies can be produced outside of the realms of the formal or what you call central banking system. And so all central banks are looking at this issue and trying to figure out how um, they can work best with, with the markets, right? As you mentioned, if you think of a world where 
everybody adopts cryptocurrencies and you know we don't use the naira or the dollar anymore you can start to see why central banks are scared because what are central banks useful for they help us control the money supply and in nigeria's case they also help us control the foreign exchange rate now if the naira is no longer being used by the wider population they have no they have much less control on that because the money they print, the money they take out of the system is not the money that individuals are actually using. So you can start to see, if you think of an extreme world where everybody adopts cryptocurrencies, you start to see why central banks are not. But again, the approach to it is not, again, a complete ban, but to regulate and formalize the central in a number of countries. You, know, you can even tax um, you know, capital gains from, from cryptocurrencies. So, it's, it's more a case of how do we formalize what is happening in that space, bring it closer to what we're used to in the banking sector, as opposed to banning it outright, because banning it outright is not going to make it disappear. It's only going to make it more informal and create a black market. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tukumba, for your time. We do appreciate it. And please, when we call you again, do answer us. All right. Let's look at the market now. Eddie, well, the bears have... Um, you know, would help their hold on the market. Jimmy, well, I spoke to some uh, stockbrokers and they believe that, you know, those are just investors who cannot wait for the dividend payouts, who just want to cash out on the gains that they've made. It's taking too long, we know, but hopefully... This week. Mm -hmm, but hopefully, you know, we'll see the big boys release their earnings soon. Hopefully they're impressive because we're at a point where, you know, those earnings will, uh, are what will direct uh, market sentiment. So hopefully this week we get to see some earnings from some of the big boys or rather some impressive earnings. Anything to just leave the market at this point is welcome. But we'll talk to Phil and Nick Bay, the research analyst at Cardinal Stone Securities, for more on what happened in market yesterday. Good morning, Mr. Anebe. Thank you for joining us on the program. Yeah, good morning, Ovidia. Now, can you tell us what happened on the banking sector yesterday? We saw huge declines, especially from GT Bank. What was responsible for that? Yeah, well, uh, GT was uh, the main uh, drag for the market yesterday. And as you know, said, uh, a couple of other banks actually uh, did well. Or I would think that it's maybe some uh, profit uh, taking on the counter uh, because that, that decline was indeed very uh, uh, material, about more or less even the gains we saw on the stock for, on Friday. So uh, the sell pressure is actually uh, big down to actually local profit taking and, of course, cautiousness in anticipation of um, uh, potential yield changes. We're having uh, options, I think, uh, OMO and NCB options this week, and uh, the market is just sitting on the sidelines to see how that plays out. What are there be a few uh, PSA or maybe major institutions that will need to take some decisive action on the back of those options? Uh, so, which could also lead to the pricing of uh, a stock. And the interesting thing is that all these are happening while oil prices are gaining uh, momentum uh, because you have find that. Uh, 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 on the sideline or maybe out of the market. So those are the uh, scenarios that have been playing out of recent. All right, and uh, just before we let you go, could you just tell us the opening calls in the market today? Well, uh, we still see um, a largely uh, bearish print uh, across uh, the market, but of course, as expected, uh, for the case of as well, you see uh, some uh, charity picking and bargain hunting uh, for some stock, for some names. Um, uh, some uh, investors may actually be uh, influenced by positive results because they are still expecting a few other uh, names to uh, release their results. So that could also provide uh, more or less for some sort of excitement and some names. So mainly uh, broadly mixed across the space as we speak. All right, Phil. Thank you for your input on the program. Do enjoy the rest of the day. Well, just before we go to the fixed income market, the market was down 0.3% yesterday at 41,564.31 points, while the equity cap was at 21.744 trillion naira. The activity chart was all red yesterday. We saw volume decline by about 29% to 340.28 million units, worth 2.64 billion naira, and all of that changed hands in 5,251 deals. 
sectoral performance was mostly negative yesterday, and it was largely due to the banking sector, which was down 2.68%, and that was due to the declines from GT Bank. GT Bank was down by about almost 9%. We also saw Wema Bank decline. Zenith Bank was unchanged, but all the other lenders were positive yesterday. So GT Bank really dragged the banking sector yesterday. Consumer goods was down 0.26%, and that was due to Declines from PZ, flour mills, Dangote, sugar, and the likes. Industrial goods was up 0.05%, and that was due to some bargain hunting on the shares of Wapco. We recall that last week, Wapco dropped by more than 11% week on week, and so investors were just taking position or taking advantage of the lower price of that stock. Insurance was down 0.84%. While oil and gas declined 0.01%. Now, the bond market was uh, it was bearish yesterday as we saw yields uh, advance in that segment of the market by about 26 basis points. Now, we saw increases at the short and the long end of the curve while the mid-segment of the market was flat. We had 23 deals worth 8.82 billion naira in that segment uh, on Monday. The Nigerian Treasury bills market was a bit quiet yesterday, but we saw some deals in that space, especially on the October 2021 uh, bill. We had 10 deals worth 9.70 billion naira. But to talk more about the fixed income market is Ramat Baba, the chief dealer of fixed income at FBN Quest Merchant Bank. Good morning, Ramat. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. Nice to be here. Well, I'd just like to get an idea of what shaped trading in the market yesterday. Um, okay, so on the treasury bills end of the market, we've continued to see um, a bit of sell-off following the sales of OMO bills by the CBN last week at 10.1% for the one-year bill. We saw the CBN taking up yield, um, taking up rates to about over 400 basis points above the last auction. At the previous auction, that's two weeks ago, we had seen um, stop rate for the one-year OMO bill at 5.74%. But um, last week, the stop rate was 10.1%. Even though a lot of market participants, a few of them anyways, had anticipated they might stop as high as 10. Some remained on the sidelines, not going for the option, while a few other streams speculated these are 10% and 10.1%. Surprisingly, market, um, the stop rate went as high as that. So, of course, market corrected with yields going up. However, in the last um, couple of days, we've seen a bit of moderation. While the initial bids in the secondary market for this bill went as high as 9.5, over the last few days, we've seen it coming down slightly to about 8.3, 8.5%, really. On All the right, Rama. Side, we, okay. I'm sorry we've run out of time, but hopefully we'll discuss this later. Ramat Baba is the chief dealer of fixed income at FBN Quest Merchant Bank. But, Timmy, we've heard what you know, these two analysts have to say. Hopefully, the equities market, we see some green today, hopefully. Yeah, and particularly the... since we saw some kind of green on the mm -hmm. industrial sector there. Maybe yeah. uh, there, might kind of, might, there might be some kind of cherry picking uh, today. All right, let's just um, keep our fingers crossed and see what happens at the end of trading today. We'll take a break and then when we come back, we cross over to London for the opening call.